Sam, have you seen these fucking hunting boomerangs? Excuse me? Hunting boomerangs. I no, was I've... watching I was watching this thing on YouTube the other day. It was like a short or whatever. And this dude just takes like have one of these boomerangs that have like the it starts as a just a big old stick, as every boomerang does, but right. naturally. You know, I've spent enough time and walking around in the main woods and just like he takes this very I, I almost want to say iconic piece of wood with a, just that, that elbow to it, just that, that good angle. And it just seems like when you're a kid, there's the innate feeling that this is a good stick a good and thwack. I want to throw it. Monkey so, brain says throw stick. Yes. Monkey brain throw stick. So he, he carves it all up. And like the whole point is like this oversized uh, thing, like, it's got to be at least four to five times bigger than your typical boomerang. And you, you throw it, you just wing it right at something. And apparently it's for like hunting rabbits and small game because you just throw the stick and it, it goes further than it normally would. And what bam, you know, you ever, you ever hear about the guy who threw a boomerang uh, and then like hit himself with it. And then he sued himself and won. That's a, how does that function? <laughs> so uh, apparently, I read this the other day too. Fun fact. Uh, so like he he apparently threw it, you know, within like several minutes went by or something like that, and he got hit, you know, by it. And then several guess, minutes. I was guess this like... in his mind, <laughs> like, he was like, "Oh, somebody <laughs> else fucking threw." It. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah, was he like won, a. Like, Two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something. It was crazy. So he has to pay himself two hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, he gets two hundred fifty thousand from the insurance. Or whatever uh, it's called. Yeah. Oh. That doesn't so count as fraud or anything. You would think. <laughs> you would think. Here I am, like watching a video about hunting boomerangs. I'm like, damn, boomeranger. <laughs> Dude, Boomer Rangers. Not enough uh, Rangers with boomerangs out there. That's fair. Like, the concept that uh, of all the classes that can just make their weapon while they're out doing their thing, Rangers are kind of top tier in that, uh, right as alongside the Druid with the casting Shillelagh. But yeah, you get like sure. a Ranger that uses the hunting boomerang? What bam! You know, goblins don't stand a chance. Look, I, I would say the boomerang is up there with the sling, you know? Yeah, it's very underestimated. Like, I saw some research, uh, you know, just kind of poking around the internet recently, and apparently slings are arguably more dangerous than bows of the same time period. I would and say that's probably... I mean, yeah, assuming, like, nobody's armored or anything, I would think No, so. no, actually, uh, slings are especially good against armor. Because, <laughs> like, you shoot an no, arrow, no, no, okay, like, it glances like right off. This. Yeah, you know, you gotta <laughs> ring that bell, you know? If anyone remembers the Spike show from the early 2000s, uh, <laughs> Deadliest Warrior. Uh, well, I like hold this up, what is going on here? What? <laughs> I have a uh, my my buddy Matthew is calling <laughs> calling me not not oh. exactly in calling into the show. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. I'm gonna have to let you go for the moment. Hope he looks into this episode and he's like, "Oh, this fucker ignored me." Anyway, <laughs> let's go ahead and start the show, huh? Uh, you know, when we're leaving people on red, we gotta go. <laughs> Sounds so distant and echoey this time. Well, I kind of like it. And hello and welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, and boomerangs. I am your host, Orion. I am your host, Sam. Uh, I feel bad for leaving Matt on red. Uh, he's got some Matt. amazing projects yeah, right. going on, dude. Get shit on, Matt. <laughs> you know he's making his own video game right 
Was that the 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 guy doing the the, the what's it called? You the know, the Red Mega Renegade Man? uh project. Basically, yeah. yeah if, if you ever played Mega Man, it, it's a, an entire video game dedicated to Proto Man during the time period of uh, Mega Man Five and Six. I have been uh, seeing his updates, and they do look pretty interesting. He does all his own sprites, and it's pretty impressive. That was pretty cool. Dude, I'm waiting for Wizards of the Coast to fuck up again. Just, you know, Just one more time before January's done. <laughs> yeah, it's almost uh, almost like momentous at this point. You know, they're, they're hitting yeah. the marks each month. They got their own personal quotas, I guess. Yeah, you know, they got quarterlies to meet. Yeah, it's just, exactly. it, you know, I'm waiting. It's just the season, <laughs> the season for fucking. Uh, <laughs> it was around this time last year. The OGL was in full swing. Oh, my God. That's so right. Maybe I got spoiled on Watsy drama. Look, I mean, we are we are planning to talk a lot about, you know, in the before times of you know 2023 when we started this podcast. <laughs> it's been a whole 50 episodes. Yeah. So we're, we're of us. no guests tonight. Unfortunately, we do love our guests. But going back to where we started, which is with nothing, but well, we felt like this is the, the way to go. <laughs> Ironic that you would say that. <laughs> we we did come, you know, from nothing, and we have slightly more now. So look, look at what we've done. Yeah, we're doing it. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. <laughs> like I always say, baby steps are still valid steps. You know? Well, that's very applicable to life and D and D all the same. Yeah, yeah. When your, your players are essentially big babies stepping through a <laughs> minefield, <laughs> um, I yeah, mean, I yes. Gonna... I, as a parent, I can attest that parenting and DMing and management are very much all <laughs> one and the same. Very like... transferable skills. You see it all across the board. My my dad, he knows this very well. He hates managing, parenting, and DMing, but. It's... <laughs> <laughs> the trifecta <laughs> the trifecta it's just like well he likes dming for the sheer fact that he can like throw situations at people and see what they got but yeah, like yeah. when you're managing people in real life is like oh i i don't get the up uh, i don't get the option of uh extra consequences and just oh, kicking that guy from your crew you know Right, you can't metaphorically, you know, trip someone down a flight of stairs in real life. You know, rocks fall, party dies. I'm oh, just saying. <laughs> oh no, this poor office building is being attacked by orcs. Ah. <laughs> that sounds like a. I, I like that scenario. I'm writing that one down. Actually, Between Michael Scott <laughs> fighting a group of goblins. <laughs> yeah, dude, Bright was, you know, it, it was wasted on Will Smith. <laughs> If you could have had a movie with a bunch of orcs and a modern fantasy attacking an office building, and then I like so excited for that movie too, I was like, oh shit! I that know you. So cool. The thing is, it took itself too seriously. It should have been like a more along the lines of Paul Blart. Yeah, I could have seen that. Yeah, like say like Paul Blart's like a failed paladin guarding a shopping mall. <laughs> And then there's a goblin invasion to shoplift all the stuff from uh, your local Dick Sporting Goods. Jesus, those monsters. <laughs> oh, dude, actually, that, that sounds kind of fun. <laughs> now, that, that's the one shot we need right there. I have to escape the local Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> Ikea is run by dwarves. You can't yeah, change my mind. <laughs> There's a sleeping minotaur inside. <laughs> <laughs> He's been sleeping there for 20 years. We don't have the balls yeah, to kick him out. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. He's trying to get out too. <laughs> the deeper this rabbit hole goes, the, be the better the one shot sounds. <laughs> that sounds really cool. Somebody <laughs> make that and uh, send us a link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send us a link to Minotaurs and Coles. I'm just saying. Uh, oh, man. So, since we are doing a little bit of a recap this this episode, you know, to look back on where we've come, 
I had a few. I created a few questions. You know, a little bit. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna quiz me. I got a little bit of a quiz here. Okay, okay, I, I'm down. I'm down. No, I, I got a lot of faith in you. You know, you're very knowledgeable. Some would say <laughs> you are. You know, you're the true intelligent mind. You know, the holder of the collective brain cell. That is. I, I, I like to think I have an approximate <laughs> knowledge of many things. I live by that quote. <laughs> yep. I even gave you, you know, some some little bit of hints in these using quotes that I said during okay, the episodes. Okay. So, uh, all right. So first things first. Who created Dungeons and Dragons? Ooh, I will that's... accept one or two answers. Or both. I mean, everyone uh, knows that like it, it came from primarily Gary Gygax and insert name here because like those two were like uh, you know the the fatherly godfathers of uh, D and D actually making Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, but a go. lot of it has its roots in war gaming. That is correct. Ding, ding, ding. Metaphorical points. <laughs> <laughs> All right. so next. What are the applications of advantage and disadvantage? Well, you know, you roll two, take the higher, take the lower. <laughs> yeah. Well, applying it to situations, you know, mm. there, there's like too many. There's too much to go off too of much. right there. Uh, <laughs> Give you a wide question there. I would accept that. Uh, <laughs> what species of dragons are most closely related to hydras? Ooh. Mm. Proto dragon. Hey, there you go. Nice. Yeah, I was editing some episodes recently. I was oh. listening to that one. All right, I feel like I feel like you'll get this one. <laughs> what is the name of the creatures utilized and bred by mind flayers? I, I want to say uh, intellect devourers. Ah, fucking four for four. Oh, yeah. Right. Those what things are plane? fucking terrifying. Oh, that was a fun <laughs> episode talking about intellect devourers. <laughs> you know, you uh, inter- there's a chance to get a intellect devourer as a pet in Baldur's Gate in at the s- start That's of the so game. Cool. Yeah, it's like you stuck inside have- uh, this corpse. Uh, hardly even spoilers, seeing as it's like six, not even 60 seconds into the game, and you're just like, oh, hey, uh, help, get us out of this corpse, we're stuck. What? Is that a real thing? It, it's a thing! You even get the option to like shove your thumb in it to cripple it in case it becomes a threat. Interesting. Well, we I don't like, know what a thumb can do. Yeah, you know, thumbs to the brain. Pretty brutal. <laughs> So next up we have what plane of existence are you most likely to find fiend demons and devils in? Uh, that would have to be the lower planes because demons are in the abyss and the devils are in the hells. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, right. see, I, I remember what my lore master <laughs> taught me. Yeah, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Now we've done several episodes on undead and the you know variants of them. So let's keep it simple. What's the most basic form of undead? Skeleton. Oh, dude, our ske- skeleton. The skeleton episode was a lot of fun. I believe was that was. Uh, <clears throat> was that the one we had our first guest, uh, Tim Vandalen, on? Oh yeah, I think you were right. Yeah, yeah, he's done, he's come a long way as a publisher. Oh yeah, he's been doing great things. Platinum bestseller, dude. And he's got it. Holy he shit. did. Uh, what is it? Uh, Free Bloom Vale recently. Mm, I think Bloom I did vale. hear about that too. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Oh, this is probably one of my one of my favorites that we talked about. What creature is described as the largest and most deadly kind of serpent in its own mythology? Ooh, I'm trying to think because like uh, there's uh, Jormungandr, the, <laughs> the fucking world serpent, and yeah. interestingly enough. I was oh, yeah? looking into some lore not too long ago, where apparently uh, in base D and D lore, Jormungandr is a legit thing, except uh, it's only really applicable towards destroying. Uh, I forget the uh, the planes, but there's a couple planes that are very Norse in their roots, so it would end up destroying those. But the concept yeah. of you could run an entire campaign based on Jormungandr getting a little out of hand and trying to destroy other planes of existence. Oh man, maybe a, like a god like 
breaks him out of those planes and he's like oh that would be yeah you try to like someone decides we don't want ragnarok so they send ragnarok to other planes of existence yeah let them deal with it yeah so the all of a sudden the uh, all of this world ending Ragnarok stuff is drifting in and it's starting with crushing the material plane. Now, in order to crush the material plane, you'd have to go through the Feywild and the Shadowfell. So then yep. you'd have theoretically a situation where the Shadowfell and the Feywild are both being crushed into the the material plane. Uh, even further so you'd get a influx of creatures and beings from the shadow fell in the fey wild and then like imagine the, the, the veil that would have on like the uh, the what am i drawing a drawing a blank the 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 <laughs> <laughs> on the tip of your tongue you'll remember yeah, yeah, yeah. after the, the podcast the 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 the, the, the astral not that the astral. Uh, the astral is the one thing that it couldn't crush. Not, I'm not thinking of the astral. Something else. Uh, it'll come. To the me. ethereal plane. The eth- mm, no. Though I, I would definitely see the like the the bleed over effects that that could cause. You got undeads reviving un unceremoniously. You got fucking. <laughs> uh, you'd get a ton of shadows. Uh, from oh, the yeah. Uh, yeah. Stuff? oh yeah mm. shade shadows the raven queen oh she would be looking for that opportunity she'd be getting paid she'd be uh, picking up people left and right because she's a patron oh yeah Lowell would be having a field day <laughs> <laughs> but all right is uh is Yerman gander your answer for this one i'm gonna say Jormungandr because you don't get much bigger than the world serpent we did mention Jormungandr a little bit in this episode, I think, but you are incorrect. It is the Bahir. Mm. I always enough, think of Bahir as having like these little stumpy legs. <laughs> they do kind of have like the stumpy little, uh, what are they called? The, the skink legs. <laughs> <laughs> skink legs? Yeah, dude, I love skinks. They're like, if you take a lizard, like a bearded dragon, for example, and then mix it with like a snake, you got this long, like chubby body, these like <laughs> tiny little legs. They're adorable. I love them. <laughs> okay. Give them the skinky leg. <laughs> Give them the skinky leg. All right. Number eight. What two creatures have a rivalry as deep as a viper and Zangoose? Ah. Uh, I specifically remember that episode because we did a crossover with Backyard Tabletop and talked about Blink Dogs and Displacer Beasts. That was very true. Nice, nice. Also, what what a fun episode that one was. I know we just keep saying that over and over, but like (laughs) talking to Backyard Tabletop was a really fun time. Oh, yeah, they're cool. I wonder if they'll come on the show again. I'll have to ask. Yeah. We passed them up in episode count uh, quite a while ago. <laughs> well, they're a bi-weekly podcast, and we're a kind of weekly podcast. I mean, we've missed some episodes yeah. over the past year, but we also lost a couple episodes. It is true. We probably lost as many as we skipped. So, um, or, No, we, we've skipped more than ah. we've lost, but because <laughs> uh, we lost uh, two or three. Uh, I want to say just two. Mm. And then uh, there was the, like, at least uh, two or three that were skipped. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Happens to the best of us. I am in the process of trying to repair uh, one of the lost episodes. Oh, wouldn't that be something? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> it was the first time that we had Amethyst Dragon on. Dude, you know he's up oh, yeah. to well over 1,700 homebrews right now and sure. counting. Like, he's going to hit 1,800 very soon. And he's putting so much into his book. I've been seeing his post on Twitter. What was it? The Amethyst uh, Trove of uh, Treasure Trove or something or other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I did see that on Twitter as well. Or X or whatever. 
Man, it's great to see like everyone we've met and everyone we talked to, like they're growing, you know, we're slowly growing. It's, like, it's everyone, a slow, yeah. The the community is, you know, feels tight. Feels very it close. really it really does. Like for as small as our podcast is, the fact that I've had situations while trying to get people on the show where someone's like, Oh, hey, I recognize you. Uh uh, some people were talking about uh, your podcast the other day and uh, whatnot. It's like, oh, wow, really? Yeah, that's definitely surprising. For sure. It's just like we're not big whatsoever. Nah, but it's it's nice to have like our niche. Yeah, I do like having a niche and having the few viewers that we do. Like, I really value that. That's why mm. I really want to get more of our viewers to kind of like uh, maybe – Leave some comments, send us some emails, the, that right. kind of thing. Because I want to interact more with the community that we're kind of growing as we go. Definitely, yeah. We want to we want to grow with them and kind of create that. Like you know, we want to be you guys' friends and more than just like a voice that you listen to maybe every week. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I want to see what homebrews y'all are cooking up. Because yeah. we know I might just kind of. Uh, yeah, I want to pull some of that into my game because I'm coming up with stuff left and right. And sure, DMing a One Piece game is cool and all, but there's tons of stuff that can be reflavored and thrown right in there. Mm. Or maybe just tossed into a, a notebook for a later campaign. Yeah, definitely true. All right. Up to the last two questions here. Oh, what let's strange go. feline race is known for the mischievous dealings and weird fingers? <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was too good of a hint <laughs> uh, yeah mikasa rakshasa hey. that was that episode all right now last but not least you take baba yaga a gingerbread house and the sinister mind of a devil mix them in a cauldron what do you get diabetes <laughs> a really bad case of diabetes. Yes. <laughs> I'm diabetic. I get to make these jokes. But you know what? <laughs> Everybody else gets to make those jokes too. That's true. That's true. I'm not going to so, restrict. <laughs> the main holders of diabetes are the hags. <laughs> this is true. Uh, so dude, I was playing Baldur's Gate diabetes. and the, was dealing with a green hag. I'm like, ah, dude, you can't trust these bitches. No, you know, you cannot. It was oh, like, oh, hey, I, I, I'm going to take care of this person's baby and resurrect their spouse. And meanwhile, the lady not expecting to have a zombie uh, brought, of her husband brought back. It's like, if she brings it back as like as a little zombie, it, she fulfills her deal and gets to eat your baby. Like, she's content yep. with that. Oh, yeah, she didn't give a shit. Yeah, no fucks given. Apparently, like, hags reproduce that way by eating babies. Yeah, yeah, they they have to like make the deals to sell people's kids, kind of like the Fae. It was very odd. Oh, they, I, I believe they are a type of Fae. Yeah, and there there are <laughs> Fae hags. I think I remember talking about them slightly. Mm. They're on. They're just a. Their entire existence seems to be on the cusp of devil and Fae. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. They, I wonder if they ever like, if there's ever. <laughs> Any like demon lords or devil lords or whatever that were or is a hag to you know there probably is. That's pretty pretty interesting. Do you think there's? I'd like to see a hag uh, warlock hag patron deity. subclass. Yeah, like a hag deity or something. That would be crazy. Like a as a hag patron, like I feel like all the abilities tied to the subclass should be something that's very monkey's paw. You know, like. Yeah. Oh, that would be so cool. Yeah. High risk, high reward. There are definite drawbacks. I would I would also honestly I would love to see like the Grim Hollows books did it pretty well. Um bringing in like curses and stuff, you mm. know. Like I always found that like curses and like the what's the word? more like the the black magic voodoo vibe, you know. Really always hits with like when you're talking about hags. Right. It's, it's very monkey's paw, right? They're very twisty and, you know, fucking up your wishes and your wants and your desires. And they taste. do enjoy that. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like, oh, yeah, I can't, I can't stand uh, that. But at the same time, mm -hmm. 
it, it for as a dm a hag is just such a valuable plot it's device a tool <laughs> you do so much you can literally do it. <laughs> i stand Coming by the hag, hag mafia threat, though bro. that's a threat <laughs> I, I i just i just like the idea of your hags being used at, to make your own little to have a mafia like they have just a network i could and, i could see like you got like three old ladies walk into a village you know there no one really cares they're just old ladies but then hmm. they start getting bingo nights together and suddenly everyone's being weird you know <laughs> <laughs> bingo night and kids start disappearing and you know yeah. people are getting monkey pod all over the place this is oh there was these weird three weirdos that walked in find another coven of hags now that town is under their control it's fucking they can go south really quick <laughs> this is true very very interesting that's kind of like my main thing here with these monster segments is i want to i want to bring out the ideas that may not be on people's minds you know give people the yeah. info to, to really apply themselves to just these creatures and you know their lore behind them that's why i really am a big fan of the audiobook well it's also a regular book but the uh, monsters know what they're doing it started out as yes. a blog a long time ago but if you're a dungeon master who's driving and you get the monsters know on audiobook, you're literally doing game prep while you are going out and about. That is true. It's like, okay, how do these monsters think? I I mean, that's, I really enjoy utilizing what time I do have, because like, lazy dungeon prep is definitely a thing. Mm. And you got to kind of utilize the time that you have so that it doesn't feel like you're working all that hard and as a dm sometimes you just gotta really get the brain juices flowing Mm. agreed agreed a little bit of research and study goes a long way situation from a book or you know a monster's personality to inspire an idea that could turn a campaign uh you have no idea the the things i come up with when i'm working that, oh, yeah. that I have to, you. I have to run and like uh, grab a scrap of paper, start writing that shit down. And I mean, like, to an audiobook, I'm like, oh, this scene would go crazy, like in a campaign. Oh, absolutely, and plenty of it for me is usable. And I, I want to tell you this stuff, but you're one of my players. Like, <laughs> I want, I want you to enjoy the surprise. Yeah, I feel that. Like. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it. Hmm. I feel that. Speaking of spoiling things, so I, I was wondering, you know, and I'm sure like our listeners may be wondering too, with, you know, this being a new year and we've been talking about, you know, changes coming to the Nerd Militia and, you know, the podcast. What are what are some things that maybe they could look forward to or expect? Well, one thing we can definitely work look forward to, uh, you actually saw a little sneak peek earlier today and if anyone's in our discord server they'd be able to see it as well i started working on putting together a intro sequence for the uh one piece D. we have two episodes recorded and i'm going to be posting those soon as soon as i finish the editing on those i'm not i can do audio editing video editing i'm kind of learning to do it's a bit of a thing yeah, but i thought it was pretty good yeah I took your notes into account and extended some of the sequences just a little bit. Yeah. And it does make a difference. And then let's see. I did find out that there is another uh, YouTube channel that is doing the same thing that we are. So Uh, yeah, since they're starting around where we are, we can look at it as a competitive, like a race. Oh, race to find the one piece <laughs> yeah yeah actually that sounds like it'd be a great idea maybe i could get the dm piece. to come on here and we can uh, talk of talk about All a right. race for the one piece that would be cool you could have like a like no a, actually no we wouldn't be able to because uh his uh campaign is set two years before the death of roger oh interesting yeah so the one piece isn't a thing yet interesting interesting yeah he's starting his campaign in the roger era 
I'm sure we could uh, we could hope that we gave some inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> if only. If only, if only. But yeah, it's definitely, you know. Ah, uh, shit. I could, I could put the, uh, some ideas in that guy's head for uh, some crazy devil fruit users to throw at his players. Like, could you imagine a centipede <laughs> devil fruit user? Dude. A wear centipede. That sounds gross. Mm, it would be. <laughs> It'd be terrifying. Your centipede. Is that Sienna back there? Yeah. Hi, Sienna. Orion says hello. Yeah, I, I love her character. She's just like all over the place. Speedster so rogues good. are great. Speedster rogue is really good. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's been loving the campaign as far as I know. She's excited for tomorrow too. Now, if any of the viewers want to, you know, whisper sweet, uh, terrible ideas into my ear to terrorize my players, <laughs> I am all ears. Please, you don't need any more time. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like the sweet nothings of the audience telling me how to torture y'all. Oh no, is that a mysterious barnacles growing on the bottom of our boat? Don't eat them. <laughs> you <the> hepatitis. <laughs> mm, termite barnacles, that could go hard. <laughs> yeah, we also have the, uh, the, the JCA stuff coming up soon. Ah uh, yeah, the Jackie Chan Adventures of Bridge. That's mm-hmm. another project that we're working on in... The, really, the biggest thing is scripting and editing. Mm-hmm. I'm writing down termite barnacles because that feels like it'd be good. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> well, you already know about it. I'll have to throw that one at somebody else. Nice, nice. Saved. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. Rustage can use that one. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, perhaps. And speaking of new things in this year, have you heard of Power World? <laughs> uh, yes, I have. Who couldn't, uh, who hasn't heard of the thing that's bringing Monster Hunter, uh, was it Fortnite and Pokemon <laughs> all into, plus a little drizzle of uh, Minecraft all into one thing? I mean, if Ark and Pokemon had like a baby that was cared for. You'd have power. <laughs> well, you know, p- babies do need to be cared for. That is true. You know, coming from you as a parent, I am glad you say that. <laughs> I didn't say it was easy to care for. Them. <laughs> true, yeah, sometimes uh, the kids they'll give you the they'll do or say things that's like, mm, mm. do I do I have to care? Uh. Well, it- I've been spending way too much time playing Power World. If anyone out there is interested, <laughs> check it out. The game is really cool. Maybe you should do an entire video on how Power I... World is a great inspiration for DMs everywhere, and this is what you can get from it and why you should check it out. Look, if there was a D&D campaign where we could capture creatures <laughs> and put them to work, then I would I'd be very down. It sounds like you should just homebrew the Pokemon t- uh, tabletop. I mean, there was one way, I guess. No, no, the, the Pokemon tabletop is absolutely a thing. Is it? I'm not surprised, I guess. I'll be... Uh, Digimon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, a, there's no reason you couldn't homebrew uh, some stuff to go with that. Yeah, I could see that. So, Sam, do you have yourself any uh, monsters this week? I did not prep a monster for this week as we are, you know, you told me that we were just going to be talking about, uh, you know, the old stuff. So nothing new this time. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Apologize for anybody who was looking forward to that. <laughs> we do like that Sam monster lore. Yeah. I was also kind of expecting that this would be a little bit of a shorter episode, perhaps. Yeah, I, I believe it's going to be a shorter episode just because... It it's been a it's been a whole thing. It's the milestone. Mm-hmm. Just kind of taking it slow uh, for yeah, take it light and easy. Yeah, 
I am booking us uh, some good guests coming up in the near future. Uh, some uh, are a little easier to convince than others. <laughs> you know how it goes. Right, right. So I did see that you had another little uh, note here for some news. Ah, yes. This is TNF, bringing you nerd news. This week in nerd news. So apparently the former D&D designer, well, not the a former D&D designer, brings Elden Ring's most iconic and difficult boss Ooh. to 5e. So people are going to be able to roll dice against the goddess of rot. Uh, oh god <laughs> oh uh, no you, you sound like you've played elden ring i have not is is this a problem Jeez. okay so first of all just picture millennia right is the boss or melina whatever oh yeah the hot she, one she would basically have like multi-attacks with times like six <laughs> yeah she's got like a bunch of arms right and almost then, like an astral monk also, like a life steal with every hit <laughs> okay okay necrotic lifesteal and then also add like cancerous poison <laughs> okay so i'm feeling like some astral monk a little bit of some life stealing undead bullshit maybe some spore druid ish type of shenanigans i can only imagine the party wipes that this one <laughs> <clears throat> well i don't know oh it says along with about 333 hit points a natural AC of 20, a, mm. a CR of 21. Yeah, that sounds all right. <laughs> uh, it's set to be a mythic monster encounter. Uh, a group will need to fully chop away at her HP in order to trigger a second <laughs> phase. Oh, my God. So, wait, CR 21. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's like ancient dragon scale, right? Like yeah, I mean... End game uh, creatures like ancient dragons tend to be in that 20 plus CR range. Oh, damn. Yeah. Then you get into like the lower deities with like 25s and stuff like that. Yeah. And then Tarask at like, what is it? 30 AC? 30 something. Yeah. The God Killer. Jesus. Yeah. This is, this is a boss with a second phase. That's, that's right. I mean, makes sense resets probably. her health to 240 clears conditions refresh refreshes expended uses of abilities and gives her flying oh <laughs> and then it, apparently some uh, aoe abilities and uh, scarlet phantoms cut uh, cut all over the place scarlet and, phantoms <laughs> yeah I, I don't know anything about what i'm reading off so you let me know how terrifying any of this is I mean, it sounds like she has like minions or something. But she doesn't have minions like in game. But uh, oh, let's see here. Eighteen. I'm just kind of like perusing over this. Uh, okay. Uh, the blur of uh, blade slashes. Uh, Six D ten damage to anything within thirty feet and heals her for each creature uh, trapped within. Woof. So we already got two phases, a shit ton of HP, uh, and she can teleport into uh, clo people that are okay. So she can teleport to your squishies. She can deal a shit ton of damage, heal off it. Ooh. Oh. Dude, this sounds just, like you got to cheese that fight. She teleports to your squishies. You like you retaliate. She heals it all back. <laughs> Damn. Uh, you know what? This is the perfect boss for a DM that really wants to kind of not hold back with their players, I guess. Look, I see if you got a party of level 20 players, they're putting up a fight. So, I mean, that would definitely be something. You know, I, I feel like most good parties with effective tactics bat above their CR range to begin with. Yeah, so I think it could be reasonable. I mean, definitely doesn't sound like a, you know, a raffle stomp or anything, but I can imagine a well-adjusted party could take it. So the well, uh, perfect traps everybody. That's fine. Okay. So <laughs> the stat block for this was posted to Twitter. 
And uh, the, yeah, the person that had created this had worked for uh, D for uh, Watsy for about four years, and then ended up getting caught in that layoff that happened recently. Ooh, I mean, what a what a thing to bite back with next. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Hmm. Uh, that is very interesting. I like that in reaction to all this bullshit going on with getting uh, laid off. I'm fuck you. I might be laid off, but I still got a job to do. Makes a massive meaty stat block. Hell yeah. Love Look, to see shows, it. Shows the work ethic. Just because they got fired doesn't mean they stopped working. You know, keep the ideas flowing. Gotta get that shit going, bro. <laughs> Bars. <laughs> I, I like it. It's interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. I always love when you know you see games adapted into D anD. d Like when I saw the Monster Hunter D anD. d stuff. I lost my mind. <laughs> I mean, so many people have done Monster Hunter D anD. d stuff over the years that. I think there's enough homebrew to effectively just make your own thing, like the most Monster Hunter intensive experience oh, ever. Absolutely. I feel like any fan of the, the Monster Hunter franchise it definitely knows what that's like. <laughs> A lot of scavenging. And I do love scavenging for monster parts and trying to be able to use them. Yeah, that was so cool. Just bloodthirsty fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Hell yeah. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, you got your notes. I don't have that much. I mean, we can move on to our little bit of a homebrew feature. All right. All right. So, boom, boom. That's a fun. Excellent. Ah. <laughs> You know why we call it the generic realm, Sam? I don't know. Was there ever a, a reason specifically? Well, there's actually a history to that bit. But uh, the primary reason is that with homebrew, it's a lot of it's generic. You can tie it to whatever realm you want. Your world, mm -hmm. official world, maybe something a little bit special. Maybe you're borrowing a setting from something. Mm -hmm. It's always fun in the generic realms. And sometimes you just mix everything together in one realm. I like that. I like it. I like it. Ooh. And that's what my uh, dad and his friends back in the day used to call it. The generic realm. Because like, uh, they had all these different uh, campaign settings like Ravenloft and Greyhawk. But like, back in the day, they used to... There used to be a major divide in the community based on setting. Like, you'd have your Eberron players, your Greyhawk players, and uh, all these different realms. Like, nowadays, everything's all on the Sword Coast focused in the Forgotten Realms. And we barely even do much with the Forgotten Realms. It's all Sword Coast. Right. Very true. Very, very true. A little bit of lore for the people out there. I like it. I've always been a fan of mixing... Uh, Eberron and uh, Faerun, mm. but treating them as separate continents. Yeah, I feel that. Where it's just like, oh, well, if you want to get over there, that's a long trip across the sea to get there. Right. Who's going right. to spend four weeks in game traveling to Eberron? <laughs> yeah, I, I like Eberron, though. Yeah. <coughs> Where all the war from. So this week's generic realm, I bring to you guys Alaric Alchemist Armor. Oh yeah. Uh, this person says they it's from a uh, game designer Thom, DM Thom, and it's supposed to be a very rare leather armor that requires attunement. Mm. And it just has like this really cool look to it. I you know, leather. Leather just mm. looks good. Got the hood and everything. Just kind of badass. I do like it. So kind of gives uh, yeah. Dishonored like, vibe. Have you ever played that game? I have, actually. And you're right. I do like the Dishonored vibe. It was definitely given, given Dishonored. I like it a lot. Okay. The, even got some flavor text here. The armor is crafted from a rare blend of materials. 
including traditional leather and exotic alchemically, alchemically treated substances. Its creation process is shrouded in secrecy, known only to a few select. The, the alchemist armor is reinforced, providing an additional plus two to AC beyond the benefits receiving for wearing leather armor. While donned, this armor uh, grants the wearer resistance to poison damage, as well as the following effects. Defensive measures. The alchemist armor features a built-in defense mechanism that activates when the wearer sustains certain types of damage. The first time each round the wearer takes piercing or slashing damage, the armor releases a poisonous gas cloud in a five-foot radius. Every creature within the area must make a DC 15 con save or suffer 2d8 poison damage. Okay, okay. The armor's like one of those little puff mushrooms. Oh, dude, I could picture this like... Hmm. I wonder if you could like change it to make it like a like a like a fog cloud you know like to, to like stealth in it, it, you know what that's not a bad idea like, for like a, use your bonus a variation hide or whatever you know that could be cool so provided the armor is donned properly and included uh has a included ventilation mask that protects the wearer from poison damage caused by the gas cloud the emission of poison uh, cloud is involuntary and is triggered solely by piercing or slashing damage. The wearer cannot control it. Interesting. Hey, if you cut yourself, you absolutely can. <laughs> yeah, right. Because that's where my mind goes to at first. Yeah. The alchemist armor has a total of 500 hit points and loses hit points for each piercing and slashing weapon attack it absorbs. Okay. When the armor hit points are reduced below 50%, the damage uh, dealt by poison gas increases to 3d8. Its armor Ooh. hit points, uh, if the hit points fall be below 10%, or about 50 hit points, it emits a persistent poison aura that deals 3d8 poison damage to any creature entering Ooh. the aura or My starting its turn. Uh, needs is this. <laughs> the armor, if the armor is destroyed by <laughs> reaching zero hit points, Okay, so when it reaches zero hit points, the armor's done. So this oh. is single-use armor. Dude, I, I feel like more armor should have health. Armor having health is very interesting, don't you think? I like, I like it a lot, actually. Because, I mean, like, how often do your party, you know, go through a hard fight, but their gear is, like, fine, you know? Yeah, and the thing is, if you're hit, this armor is going to take a, that hit as well. Yeah. So this the hit points for the armor is just a matter of tracking how long it's going to be useful. Mm -hmm. Right. To restore the alchemist armor to its full 500 hit points, the wearer must find a craftsman with the requisite skills to repair it. The necessary skill uh, level, cost, and potential DC checks involved in the repair mm -hmm. process are at the dungeon master's discretion. I want my plague doctor to have this. <laughs> Now, they did use Mid-Journey to come up with the art for the armor, but you know what? I think it looks really good. Like, Yeah, it looks good. AI usually doesn't pump out something that looks that nice. And you know, when, like, it, when it comes to armor sets. To probably use to, uh, you know, maybe some Photoshop or something to clean it up. It looks yeah. really good. I like it. Like, they probably had, like, a base design to start with. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you know, you definitely can see that in the description of it. Because, like, you can even see, like, little parts of it where it looks like it could be holding, like, a poisonous uh, stuff underneath the I, surface. Yeah, I can see this being, like, a very, like, specific usage case, but very strong in that usage case. So, like, I like it. Mm. Uh, same. It's just... It's very interesting. You don't come across armor with HP that often. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, honestly, all magic armor should have HP. And honestly, that, I can find alternative really? uses for armor like this. Like, what if the party doesn't even wear it at all? Like, what if you, like, tape it to a shield? 
<laughs> well, then you well, wouldn't have the gas mask. It. But what if you like you threw it at something and then it has to be attuned. So that wouldn't work. Wait, it it did say attunement, didn't it? Yeah. You uh, gotta be wearing it. Uh I don't think there was an attunement actually. It says requires attunement. Uh, yep, you're right, you're right. I was like, am I blind? <laughs> no, I, I was looking at the, the second page. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I dig it. I give it a, I give it a 10. I like it. Definitely a 10, because like, it's just, it seems like it can be so situational and a double-edged sword, so you got to use it wisely. Oh, yeah. All right. So, next up, uh, what what you got, Sam? So this is an item that uh, I see kind of a lot when I'm looking through, you know, some of like the Pinterest or Twitter or stuff like that, you know. And it's the basically like the wingsuit, you know, the copper cuirass. All right. So it says any medium or heavy armor except hide, uncommon and requires attunement. So the complement. This robust but aerodynamic suit of armor, the ingenious smith Drimmer divides a pair of intricate mechanical wings, powerful enough to raise their wearer aloft and imbue them with dizzying speed and agility. They produce a soft, soothing hum when gliding through the air. Yeah, I and like I look that. At these wings, and they kind of give me like uh, hmm. angel Raxman vibes, or like, hmm. like, a, like, a, like a, I feel that. Like? Like a homelander, but if he had wings <laughs> type deal. That'd be cool. So the armor has 10 charges and it gains 1d6 plus 4 expended charges daily at dawn. First of its abilities are aerial dash. The armor's large wings propel its wearer through the air, but can only remain active for short periods of time. As a bonus action while wearing it, you can expend one charge to gain a flying speed of 30 feet until the end of your turn. Well, you got the consistent drain of charges to fly. We have trick of the flight. The wings can be deployed as a, at a moment's notice. When you make a dexterity saving throw while wearing this armor, you can use your reaction to expend two charges in order to fly 20 feet without provoking opportunity attacks. Um, if this movement takes you out of the area of the effect that triggered the saving throw, you gain advantage on the saving throw. And if you would take half damage on success, you instead take no damage. Hmm. That's pretty good. I like that. Next up, we have Rare Variant. Using the Aerial Dash property now gives you a flying speed of 60 feet. Using the Trick of Flight property only costs one charge. In addition, the shield gains a new property. Hmm. So we have Safe Landing. Uh, when you would take damage from falling, you can use your reaction to expend one charge to try and use the wings to avoid the impact. Make a DC 13 dexterity acrobatics check. On a success, you take no damage from the fall. And then, last but not least, we have the very rare variant. The armor has 12 charges and regains 1d8 plus 4 charges daily at dawn. Using the air dash property now gives you a flying speed of 60 feet. Using the trick of the flight property only costs one charge. And the shield also gains safe landing. Oh, I think I just read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so all the previous stuff, but see, stepped up. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. I like it. This is something that like just adds mobility to, you know, anything. And like a paladin with these. Oof. Mm. I could see so many different uses for something like this. So and many variants, so many like... I, I like that there are variations of it, because then you can kind of make it upgradable. Yeah, oh yeah. You could upgrade into a variant. Upgrade and modify and oh, tweak it. They got the tinker abilities. Oh yeah. I like it. Yeah, probably give that about a, about a seven or eight. And I this one that. was created by Loot Tavern on uh, what's it called? Patreon. Shout out to them. Yeah. We got the links in the description as always. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for your creations. We love talking about them. Absolutely. 
I can't wait till viewers start sending in their creations. <laughs> that would really be something. But I think that's about all I have prepared for this episode. I can't Do you have anything else. I can't say I have much else either. Mm. Keeping it short, keeping it uh, sweet. But we're looking forward to the new year in the next 50 episodes. Oh, yeah. Shout out to the next 50 episodes. Maybe it won't take us all year this time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I think we got this. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the things that we're going to, you know, we have planned, the things we do. It's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. And as always, you know, we're Dungeons and Talk Shows. Y'all can check us out on all the the socials, wherever podcasts are casting. Uh, we're getting back on track with our editing. Uh, the pods be potting. <laughs> pods be potting. Um, and we do have our Patreon. We should start putting some uh, homebrew up on there. I, I bet some people would like that. We should. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I am Sam. This is Orion. We're your Dungeons and Talk shows. Have a good week. Have a great week, everyone.